So good evening. It's so nice to have you all here. Welcome to our live stream podcast tonight, The Spiritual Practice of Eating. I'm here with Leah Donatello. Do you want to say hi, Leah? Make sure the volume's all working and everything. Hi, yes. Can you hear me? Awesome. It's uh, it's so nice to have you here. If you are tuned in and you want to share where you're from in the chat, we'd love to hear to find out um, where, you know, where you are around the world. We've got people potentially in Peru or the East Coast and the West Coast. So maybe a global gathering here this evening. So um, I wanted to start by the topic tonight is the spiritual practice of eating. And I wanted to talk, start off by talking about why it was that Lee and I wanted to do this live stream together, uh, what inspired it, and, and to, to start the conversation. Um, but first, I wanted to start with introduction. Leah, maybe you could tell us a little bit about yourself, where you're from, what you do, that kind of stuff. Sure. So I'm from North Vancouver, British Columbia, but I have lived in Peru for the past nine years. Um, I quite recently, I guess over the past couple of years now, I've been working as a holistic nutritionist. So basically, I help women, usually women who surf, work through their issues of energy, poor digestion, and finding food freedom. So basically being able to incorporate a wide range of foods into their diet. Um, and I've also done work in the nonprofit sector in Canada and in Peru. Yeah, it's one of the things that I really like about you, Leah, and one of the reasons I was excited to do this is that your background and practice is really, you know, coming from uh, being connected to the earth and being involved in uh, in in the sort of the energy world, which I'm sure surfing is. I've only tried it once myself. Um, so that's 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 inspiring to me. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Colin Matthews. I work as an intuitive counselor and I'm a medical intuitive. And so what that is is people send me their name and their age, and then using that information, I tune into their energetic system. And I get images, feelings, impressions about where they're investing their energy and whether those investments are serving or not. And so it's interesting because eating is an investment. You're choosing to, to nourish yourself and eat. And so it fits really well into this practice uh, that we're, we're talking about here this evening. So, um, how, Leah, how can people reach out to you to work with you if they wanted to see you as a, as a holistic practitioner or as a coach? The easiest thing would probably be to just email me. So it's hello at leahdonatella.com and I can pop that in the chat. And otherwise, Instagram, leah.donatella. Leah. We can just take the conversation from there. Gotcha. Um, Shauna's saying she's having a bit of trouble hearing you. And let's see if this works. Uh, okay. <clears throat> And then for myself, you can go to my website, colinmatthews.ca. You can book a one-on-one -on -one session with me. You can um, book an, an in-depth transformation where we do several things together. Oh yeah, awesome, Leah. You've got uh, your website in the chat, so that's great. Um, and then you can also, I'm, I'm starting to launch some programs. I have a, a three-month intensive to help people to get more in touch with their intuition and use a lot of the techniques and skills that I work with. So if you want to find out about that, colinmatthews.ca. I'll post it in the chat as well. So how do, why are we having this conversation? Um, Leah, maybe you want to start with that? What, what inspired this? Yeah, so basically what inspired this was I worked with you back in April. And from there, I took what we talked about and just started applying it and in different through different practices, through my yoga practice, through a trip to the jungle, through a whole bunch of different modalities. Um, but you were really the starting place for me. And I just think that the people who I work with could really benefit from what you do. So I approached you to basically collaborate and be a part of my program. So moving forward, anybody who works with me in one of my um, intensive programs will get a session with you. Yeah, that's and 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 that's I, I love that because I've had nutritional challenges in my lifetime. I was gluten intolerant. I started getting bumps all over my skin and I didn't know what to do about it. And so I, I made changes to my diet, but I also made changes to my investments in my life where I was pouring my energy, what, where I was losing. And I found tremendous healing in that. And so that you're looking as a nutritionist to work on the, on the, the details and the practical and the 
you know, the, the, the mechanics of eating, you're also interested in the energetics of it as well, too. And I, I don't know how you separate those two truthfully, having healed that in my own journey. And I'm sure you see that as well with the people that you work with. So, um. yeah, well, that's what that's the difference between, let's say, a dietitian and a holistic nutritionist, right? Is a holistic nutritionist takes the time to look at the, the whole person rather than calories in versus calories out right. kind of approach. Yeah, exactly. And that's and we we that's exactly what we talked about. You know, just because you can bring in energy doesn't mean you're nourished, which mm-hmm. kind of brings us to the topic of of the spiritual practice of of eating. Um Leah, I, I I was curious, did you start as a surfer and become a holistic nutritionist, or were you a holistic nutritionist that took up surfing? No, so I started as a surfer and it's interesting because I wanted to be a surfer for a really long time. I moved to a town where that's basically the only thing to do, main thing to do. And it was just so hard for me to learn. It took me, like, I spent maybe three years just floating on a board. And, like, (laughs) it it took forever. And I finally took lessons. But around the time that I took lessons, I was also making big shifts in my diet. And finally, kind of like stepping up and saying, you know, I know these foods don't serve me. And I was letting some things go and I was bringing other things in. And I was like, and at the same time, you know, I had more energy and I started training outside the water, t- taking lessons. And, and I was like, you know what, this is really working. And I wonder why. And that's mm. when I started. Um, and I was like, I know what I'm doing and I want to be able to explain it and have some scientific background behind me and not just like, this is what worked for me. And this is what will probably work for you. Like I, wanted to be able to communicate that and so I went back to nutrition school and then realized that other surfers could benefit from this and that's why I niche down into working with surfers and ocean inspired people yeah and and I'm sure that attracts a certain type of person I was a rock climber for years and not everyone's a rock climber I'm sure not everyone is a surfer you have to be attracted to being around intensity and finding freedom and all, and all of that but your journey and process to me is so inspiring because it really speaks to what i think of as the essence of what is a spiritual practice instead of doing something and saying oh screw it i'm not good at this what's the use what's wrong with me and falling into a victim consciousness instead you mm-hmm. opened yourself to that idea of what of me how wh- what is this asking of me why is this so hard for me how come i don't have any energy how do i feel myself to to be able to actually do this and so far as to become a holistic nutritionist. I, I, I followed a similar path. I had a spinal injury as a kid and I was in tremendous pain. I had chronic shoulder tendonitis as a rock climber. I started doing yoga and, and realized, wow, this is amazing. This is really helping me. I want to teach yoga. I want to learn this. I, I, I had a degree in physical education, so I had a movement background. But, but instead of being like, oh, well, my body's messed up. What am I going to do? I said, oh, how does it change me? And inspired me to share that with people around the world. So I, I call that the archetype of the wounded healer. We, we, for me, it's a wound. I don't know if yours is a wound so much as the, the, the challenged healer. Or... It was a sore spot, for sure. Like, you know, nutrition never came easy to me once I got on my own right like when you grow up in a family you grow up with this like well for me there was a big culture around eating as as an Italian right and then you get on on your own and you're like why when I eat pasta now I'm gaining weight or now you know things start to hit you differently yeah um and now like you I came from background in human kinetics I have a bachelor's degree in human kinetics so I was like I thought I understood what being healthy meant and how it's supposed to feel and technically I you know had some of that background but the application is so different than reading textbooks, right? Yeah, for sure. For sure. I, yeah, that's such a, a, a great common experience. And, you know, it really, to me, gets at, and I, I noticed you said it was a sore spot for you with the with the surfing and the nutrition. And that's what it was for me. I had sore spots as well, too. And these are places that we lose power instead of like doing something being like, oh, that's not for me. And I'm OK with that. You're like, oh, what's mm-hmm. going on? And it and it. And it hurts and it, it pokes at something. And that that poking, to me, what a spiritual practice is, is it's an act of devotion. It's taking the poke mm. and saying, I want to devote myself to the poke. Not not as a masochistic approach, but as a, hey, there's got to be something in here for me. It, it, wouldn't, yeah. it wouldn't be like that if it wasn't that way, you know, and it brings you to your knees and that can help you to open. So... Um, so cool background. So we, we organized, was there anything else that you want to talk about in terms of why we're having the conversation or did that I'm, you think I might've missed or whatever? 
No, let's get into it. I'm um, so part of me want part of me wants to get into your background. I saw you post some pictures with your family making it look like lasagna <laughs> or something. And my wife's family is Italian, and I've spent many hours in basements making ravioli and mm. and whatnot. And I know how intense the the connection between food and culture and love is in that so i know it that can make it even more challenging to get in touch with yourself rather than a tribal programming of how to eat or how to nourish yourself so i imagine that's mm -hmm. been a part of your journey too for sure yeah i mean eating pasta at a university cafeteria just sits different than eating pasta homemade pasta that your grandma made for you yeah right yeah, exactly. Yeah, there's 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 love in that one, and we'll we'll get into that tonight. So you had talked about eating as a practice, and you were, you're looking at it in three specific categories, which I love the organization you did, which was energy, which mm -hmm. which I'm calling fuel, like it's where do you, yeah. like fueling yourself, digestion, which I'm calling taking in life and 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 letting go what's not there, and then the last one is food freedom which to me, I would bring in the intuition and spiritual practice element in that. And so um, does that resonate with you, those categories uh, in the way I'm looking at it? Yeah, so energy, by energy, I mostly mean energy balancing. So how do you, you know, um, wake up with energy, surf, and then refuel, like you said, so that you have that balanced energy throughout the day. Um, and these are based on the problems I see in my practice, basically. So, you know, people often feel burnt out, um, they can have a really good surf and then after they're just depleted right digestion and digestion goes right along with gut health and things like food sensitivities constipation um not being able to eat certain things so um you know just feeling like food makes me worse and food freedom is also can also be called um sometimes can be called intuitive eating so yes. oh, okay yeah that's a very popular hashtag as i did my post on tiktok it was way up there almost as high as intuition so Clearly, uh, clearly, it's a popular thing. Um, yeah, it's so interesting to me the, that eating is such, is such a challenge. And I love that you got, came to it through surfing because one of the things we talked about is the energetic ask of surfing. Like, I'm mm -hmm. sure if you wanted to take up gardening, you may not have explored it, nutrition, in the mm -hmm. same way as surfing or as yeah. sunbathing or as something else. So there's something about... Right. But surfing, what, what's the energetic ask of surfing? Like what makes it so intense or, strong or, or significant? Yeah, well, surfing, it's like it's already like, oh, I can like feel it in my body. Like it's hard, right? Because especially when you're learning, you're using like the strongest person can get on a surfboard and just feel completely depleted. Um, you never know the conditions you're going to get. Uh, it depends on the board you use, depends on the beach you surf. Any surfer will tell you this, that it can just be exhausting. It can also be exhausting, not only on a physical level, but a mental level. Because surfing, you're often like reading the waves, you're reading the crowd, trying not to get hit by other people. You're not, you know, trying not to hit anyone else. You're trying to read the wave and figure out what turn you're going to do next. And um, can also be really um, heavy on the adrenal system that like, that, you know, that stress of like, oh, is this, is this wave going to knock me out? Do I need to paddle around? And um, oftentimes you're working on your own mental game of like, am I good enough to surf this wave? Is this wave too steep for me? Am I in the right position? There's a lot of mental stuff that, mm. you know, you're, you're basically trying to get in sync with mother nature and you don't know exactly what it's going to do, right? And so you're trying to line yourself up with that. And then it, there's the physical aspect, which if you surf for two hours, an hour and a half, it's, you know, there's a huge, it's there's a lot of strength. There's also a lot of endurance. I usually refer to it as an endurance activity and any endurance activity, 60 minutes or longer, um, you really want to get those glycogen stores up. Right. So yeah, there's, there's so much to it. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I race, uh, I, I'm a, a cycling racer and glycogen stores are significant, mm -hmm. uh, part of it. Going back to the spiritual practice as a rock climber, I just identified with tons of the things you said there. I'm not surprised I ended up in yoga as a rock climber because the mm -hmm. demands of being calm and present and clear in the intensity of what's going on where you really have to be able to move and contort your body yeah. it just let itself into yoga. And sounds like for you dealing with the raw power of the earth and, and of waves and of actually, I guess, of the moon 
it would make a lot of sense to 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 be brought to the place where nutrition becomes significantly important and that's to me once again it's not just the the physical demands of the the sport and i i'm guessing that a lot of surfers have a spiritual mindset there's something about being connected to something greater than yourself that's a part of it yeah a lot of times you see surfers walk into the ocean and they'll just like bring their hands through the through the sea and like make the sign of the cross as in like a you know like a thank you or a let me be safe a lot of the times um you see people connecting, meditating on the beach before because you know you're going into something that's bigger and more powerful than you. Yeah, it's like... Lit- nothing it's- like surfing, yeah, that can make you feel so mm-hmm. small or so powerful. It's literally bigger than you. Like, <laughs> like it, you, you really do have to surrender to something greater than yourself and, and, and to mm-hmm. feel yourself. And that's I love that because to me, it makes eating a devotion. You can't phone it in. You can't just be like, oh, I'll have a bag of chips and whatever. It's like, mm-hmm. oh no, wait a second. Like I, this is serious. I mean, it's the same for me as a cyclist. If I don't nourish myself or feed myself properly, fuel myself for my ride, I'm going to get dropped. I can't keep up with everybody. Yeah. It's, there's no, it's black and white to me how significant it is. Yeah. One of the things with surfing too is you don't get to refuel halfway through a session. You don't get, you know, you don't have a second chance. So it really is all about your eating patterns. It's about um, what you ate a week before or two weeks before. It's never about what you ate. I mean, what you ate the day before helps. Mm-hmm. What you you know supplemented with or your superfoods they can help. But it's really about your overall eating pattern. Where and that's where we get into the problems. It's like, okay, I could eat healthy for one day. I can put effort in for one day. But how do I make this a habit? How do I make this or you know you could even say a ritual? Mm-hmm. How do we and then, and then that's where we get into once you even sort that out, okay, these are the foods that are good for me. How do I make it so my body can actually become nourished from them when I can't digest chickpeas or brown rice or quinoa or something? Right. So yeah. it's all really connected. Yeah. We, um, for those watching to know, I asked Leah, I said, what are some of the most common things that you see and, and having enough fuel to, to do the activity seemed like a really big one. I just noticed Deanna said, is that my problem? I, I know Deanna and actually Deanna, you're a good person if to, to talk about, because yes, I do think fuel is a part of it, but there's also the part about wanting to nourish yourself, believing you're worthy of food. Like we, I've moved to the country and we're, we grow a lot of our food now. And it, for a while, every day, I'm like, I spent three hours in the kitchen. I'm like, food is such a huge part of my life. I can't believe how difficult this is. And now I'm like, oh, wow, look at all the time I, I value to nourish mm-hmm. myself that I'm, I'm willing to put in and, and make sacrifices to, to value myself to the degree that I'm willing to put in that time. And you mentioned that people don't want to, or some of the people you work with, don't want to put in the time or resent having to put in the time to properly nourish yourself. Do you, do you want to talk about that? Yeah, so one thing, people are always looking for the quickest way to do something, oftentimes. Um, and I think, actually, it's kind of an unpopular opinion now, but taking the time to prepare your food, to um, make something from scratch, just hits different. And some people, you know, they even forget to eat. They're just like, oh, and I just realized it was 3 p.m. and I yeah. only had coffee that day. Yeah. And it's like, do you really need a nutritionist to tell you that that's not helpful? Yeah. Yeah. But, and and I would call that an expression of self-love, like nourishing yourself, mm-hmm. fueling yourself is an expression of self-love. It, Deanna just wrote here as well. It's hard to do with a full-time job teaching and training and having a social life. Mm-hmm. And, 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 and that's where the bad habits arise or the medical intuitive response to bad habits is, and that's where you choose to invest in things that don't actually meet your needs. They may feed you, but they don't fuel you or they may fill you up, but they don't nourish you. And that's uh, in my post I did today. That's true for food. That's true for relationships. How many of Mm -hmm. people in the world are in a relationship because it's good enough? It doesn't really feed me, but I'm not alone and I give companionship and or same with work. Like, yeah, this job doesn't totally feed me or nourish me, but it pays the bills. And, and so self-love, you know, I've worked my life to make self-care such a priority so that I can be so loving to people. It's not, it's not a selfish Mm -hmm. act for me. It's a, 
it's a it's a devotion to help keep me at my best so that I really can be at service for other people. Definitely, I agree, but also sometimes good enough is good enough. Right. You know? Yeah. And also we need to do we do need to there's I think sometimes we think it's an all or nothing approach and that's why diets fail is because when you think of a diet as something temporary, a diet shouldn't be temporary. I always use this 80-20 approach where it's like 80% of the time you are, you know, eating the whole foods and doing everything you can and that 20% where you may fall off or you may want to go out for dinner or you may be running late or whatever it is, you grab that takeout without a second thought because that's what's going to help you show up 100% at your job maybe, right? So I think sometimes good enough is okay. Um, maybe not in like the other, you know, the relationships or things, but sometimes with food, I think it is actually okay to just take that pressure off. And that's where intuitive eating comes in. Yeah. And, and I would actually argue that it is good enough in relationships and work as well too. <laughs> and and my, my reason for that is if there isn't friction, there isn't growth. If there isn't mm-hmm. like, you know, I, 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 in medical intuition, I call like the one side removing the aggravant. And that's the boy in the bubble challenge. It's like, I'm going to sanitize everything. I'm never going to eat anything bad for me. I'm only going to have this pure existence. And you lose a quality of robustness that to me, I, I don't think surfers would be described as non-robust. I'm mean, They're robust people. You have to be. You're going to get thrown around. You're getting launched. You're getting tumbled. Mm-hmm. You're, and, and so part of life is to develop an immune system to deal with difficult things. And so certainly 80-20, I would actually say is good for your immunity because you don't want to be the boy in the bubble, right? No, yeah. And and then on the the other end of the boy in the bubble is is the who cares, whatever. I'll just smoke, drink, whatever. And then, you know, that also doesn't work. And so the, these are the extremes. And, and it's funny, anytime there's a paradox, to me there is a uh you're on the spiritual path because because para- mm-hmm. spiritual challenges don't have clear straight answers and so the paradox is if i only eat pure i'm actually weakening myself but if i only eat crap i'm weakening myself so how do i nourish myself and there's that being able to dance in that spectrum then yeah and i think that the practice in that is is accepting it and 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 getting over kind of, yeah, just getting over yourself in that there is no perfect diet. There's no one way to eat. Um, and, and you do it, you, you make the best choice that you have in that moment. And I think that in itself is a practice because we are not conditioned to, to do that. Yeah. Yeah. So I have a question for you. The people that you work with that struggle with feeding themselves, I, I identify that as an, in, from my intuitive perspective, as a lack of self love or self worth. Mm-hmm. It's like, you are worthy of caring for, of nourishing. I, I certainly didn't have that when I, before yoga, I would push, 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 push. A goal-oriented accomplishment. It's about getting there. It's not about be, ner- take loving myself through the process. You know, I was in tremendous mm-hmm. pain and my pain was inconvenient rather than a part of myself that needed my love and attention. And mm-hmm. so I've I've really found through that it's, it's an expression of love. And I'm wondering the people that struggle to spend the time to prepare food, to, to take up time, maybe they just love doing other stuff way more. But I wonder if part of it is I don't see the value in truly valuing myself. Yeah, with, with them, I kind of, I encounter a lot of indifference, a lot of like, mm. Mm, I don't know, like, you know, and it comes back to, it's, you know, it's once we've checked all the boxes, and I've given them every recommendation I have. And there's just still this level of like, mm, I don't know. It's like, but right. there has to, the, the client has to reciprocate and has to put in, in the effort. Um, because you could read us, you know, you could absorb, you could have all of the knowledge, but if you don't apply it and, and work with it. And the thing is, is nutrition takes time. That's why I only work with clients for, Uh, you know, for a minimum of three months, because you're going to have fluctuations in your cycle, in your stress, in your family, and you need time to, I always say like, clients need time to like, feel the the improvements, but then also feel what it feels like to backtrack a little bit and then just get back up. So I want them to have struggles. I want them to be like, 
you know what, this week, this happened. I want them, you know, like I want to see stuff that I can be like, oh, and then get in there and work it out, you know? Like, yeah. And I love that because that's the creation of robustness. Like I, mm -hmm. I worked with um, some conscious birth educators and I loved the expression that they shared, which is that coming out of the birth canal is actually um, supports the health and well-being, like the constriction and the squeezing. It mm. clears the amniotic fluid from the lungs. And so something that's uncomfortable and difficult is actually nourishing life. And so this process of, of, of friction, of growth, of falling down, of getting up, of getting in on a deeper level, that to me is exactly how we grow and learn. It's literally how we come into the world and it's how we mm -hmm. grow and learn. And so that's, I'm, I imagine it's hard to see people when they get here to not want to give up as they're going through the waves, but, you know, so essential to, to be able to navigate all of that. Mm -hmm. And that just reminds me of the next point, which would be digestion. And I don't know if we're ready to move. Yeah, yeah. Go, go into it. Yeah. Okay. Um, but, you know, just ha hearing you say, you know, when th things are kind of supposed to be hard at times and a lot of people will eliminate foods from their diet because they have a hard time digesting them, right? Mm -hmm. Like you'll hear, oh, I can't eat chickpeas, I can't eat quinoa, I can't eat high fiber foods. I'm on the low FODMAP diet, like blah, blah, blah. And the that's your body telling you, like, I need love and care and attention, not don't ever eat this nourishing food. Like if a healthy food, like by healthy food, I mean a whole food, if it's giving you problems, there are usually things you can do to make that better. And kind of the last thing you'd ever want to do is never eat that food again. It's like if you go to the gym and lift a weight and it's hard, you don't just never lift a weight again or never move your body again, right? You figure out a way around it. You do something else. It, um, it's so easy to make a conclusion that because it's, it, it, it is right now being received in your, in your body as an aggravant. I, it, I call mm -hmm. them aggravants. It's mm -hmm. like it's because it aggravates you. That doesn't mean it always is. It means you are aggravated by the thing that you just took in. And yeah. and you can be not so aggravated. I For me, when I was gluten intolerant, I, I it took me seven years. I can eat a big bowl of pasta now and I'm okay. I feel a little sleepy. I'm not on my sharpest right. game. I didn't eat any before our talk tonight. But at, <laughs> at, at the same time, it I don't I'm not fragile. And that's mm -hmm. to me the challenge of not developing robustness is that you end up creating fragility. Um, and that that dance is is such an a, a, a important challenge to to take the robust thing and once again you go back to the love that you mentioned it was my self-esteem i was investing in what other people wanted and not in what i wanted i didn't have good boundaries my ability to absorb what nourished me and get rid of what didn't was weak and that's what I, from a medical intuitive perspective, that's what I'm seeing when people have food intolerances. It could be that they're allergic to it. It could be that it's not a healthy food for them. Right. And, but I it, mean, I was just going to say, if you feel like it might be an allergy, like go get tested. I'm not saying if you're allergic or have celiac disease, like try and eat gluten. I don't mean that. I mean, if a whole food makes you feel bloated or you just feel like, you know, that food just doesn't work for me there might be more to it than if it's not an allergy. Always rule out allergies if it's very persistent. Rule yeah. them out and then figure it out. Like none of this is meant to diagnose, cure, or treat disease. Yeah. <laughs> should probably say that. And it, no, well, but it's, it's interesting. Like there, we know that, that food is, uh, is medicine. You know, like if you're not, like mm -hmm. I'm drinking chamomile tea here. Why? Because mm -hmm. my throat's been sore. And and man, it totally helps. It's wonderful to do that. It's obviously not as potent as a prescription medication, but it is medicine. So how you feed yourself can heal or worsen the conditions in your body. And we we loosely touched on this and I'm, I'm not well enough studied in the energetics of food. Like the energetics of chamomile is clearly to soothe, to calm, to settle, to, to ground. It's, it's a wonderful... Uh, flour for doing that gluten or flour when I did that it to me was actually about bulk and scarcity when I like when I went on a gluten cleanse what I found myself noticing is how much it's like there's not going to be enough is part of the consciousness and if you look at, at the gluten or the wheat grains that we have here in North America now they're heavily hybridized and and whatnot to produce 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 these are these are negative ends of the capitalistic spectrum, in my opinion, of, of food. And so no wonder people are getting aggravated by that because 
They want to not to be filled up, but to be fueled or to be nourished. Mm. And so being able to discern that. And so, yeah, like I prefer eating a whole food, healthy diet than a bowl of pasta. But I love a bowl of pasta every now and then. Mm-hmm. And so, yeah, it, I, 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 I hope people get more into the energetics of food because there's a consciousness in the wheat. There's a consciousness in the chamomile and, and how that feeds you, yeah, I think, is really cool. I think, too, you can even go deeper and say, you know, where is that food grown? Who grew it or who prepared it? You know, I when I was in the jungle, one of the participants on my retreat was like, that's why you always bless your food when you're in a restaurant, because the stress that those chefs are under then you get your plate of food, you know, they're always like, you want to. Yeah, no, you know, it's, this is why we're talking tonight. When I was 19, I was like, there are three pillars of food consumption. There's how it's grown, how it's prepared and how it's consumed. And, Mm -hmm. and medical intuition is profoundly interested in control because empowerment is about taking control of the places you have control and letting go of the places you don't. It's the serenity prayer. Like, and, mm-hmm. and, and being able to discern between those two things. And you only actually truly always have control over the third one. So mm-hmm. I'm pretty sure that if you got to pick up some fast food on the way home and you practice number three well, your body will best adapt to receiving the nourishment from it and eliminate what doesn't serve you. And if you're like, oh, well, what right. am I supposed to do? You know, there's, it's all I got. I got no time and there's disbelief. It's, you're not, it's not going to feel you in the same yeah, way. You just send gratitude that you're able to afford that food and you're able to eat that food in the time that you have and and you move on and that's the big thing i think too is like the next day you just move on you don't dwell on it you don't write in your diary about it like yeah you you, every if we were that conscious of every breath we were taking we would go crazy like you (laughs) there's only so much presence you can put into what you do and the body is robust you know Mm -hmm. I've, I've eaten things that were, had gone bad and didn't feel very good. And I got better, you know, like that's, we're, we're meant to, um, to recover. And like, here's, here's the one that I always think of, like if food is so toxic, why is it that there are little kids that only eat butter and cheese pasta and they're fine. They grow, they've got energy They're you know, I'm, there, there is more to life than just the stuff yeah. that you bring into your we're body. In other ways. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Um, Oh, I wanted to I wanted to get into this whole thing of of bloating in mm-hmm. in digestion because clearly that's like the body not being able to process the food it's taking in, know what to mm-hmm. do with it. Um and and there you get a reaction to what's supposed to nourish you. So and you see that a lot with the people you work with, hey? Yeah, well one big reason for bloating is constipation. Mm. So food stools backed up and then more food's going in and it has nowhere to go. So like the food starts to kind of ferment and let off gas and you're stuck being bloated. Um, So that's like physiologically a lot of the times what's happening. Sometimes it's also just, it could be a response to um, eating a food that you can't really process. So let's say you feel like you're intolerant to something or something doesn't just, just doesn't work. And there could be other reasons, but those are, those are big ones. So these, this is so cool from a medical intuitive perspective, because constipation is about being able to let things go and so it's like holding on to old ideas not welcoming new ideas and it's interesting Mm -hmm. you change your diet these are new things and you get bloated or constipated it's like hard for you to digest they're new you know your Mm -hmm. body needs to adapt it needs to to evolve and recognize you know like let's say you've always kept to yourself and someone suggests you start communicating more you're gonna Mm -hmm. you're gonna get constipated you're gonna get aggravated Mm -hmm. i remember I, I did a retreat one time and it was so intense. I got constipated. It was more information than I knew how to take in. And I didn't know what to assimilate and what to let go of. And it was, yeah. it was intense. It's very, very common for people when they travel to get constipated. Mm. And I had a client share with me that even if she stayed the night at a friend's house, like one night, it's just, right. or in the past, actually, we were able to work through that. But Oh, that's um, good. <laughs> um, but yeah. It's that's super common and that energetically would make sense. Yeah. And so the other part too, in terms of diet, like what is digestion? It's about taking in, assimilating. That means, you know, you're not going to meet a perfect human being who's only love and is all healed and, and will only care about you and, and nourish themselves at the same time. Everyone's got their stuff. 
And so you have to be able to be like, I really love how caring this person is. And they're kind of intense, you know, or Mm -hmm. I really appreciate, you know, this person's, you know, psych and vibe, but I can only take so much of it, you know. And so that's those are signs of how we assimilate what's going on. And when it's hard, when you struggle with assimilating what nourishes you and releasing what doesn't, it's going to affect your digestion. It, it's good that's because that's where it goes because you're you're literally not gi- digesting life experiences in a in a way that honors the robust quality of the human body and the reality of living in an, a world that is constantly growing and evolving yeah so i mean with like from a physiological perspective there's the mechanical breakdown of food and then there's the like the assimilation of the nutrients or the absorption of the nutrients. So there's a lot of processes that can just be can be broken down or there can be like cracks along the way, right? Like it's not just the stomach, it's not just the intestines. Even your saliva starts the digestion process. Right. So Yeah, yeah. And and if you're not consciously taking in your food, that it, it's mm-hmm. not doing its part fully as well too. It's a it's a whole dance, uh eating there, it in there's that there's so many things you can do along the way like you know if you are struggling to like you said take in your surroundings you're in a new place that's where you need to apply those (coughs) practices and the practices of sitting down eating mindfully mindfully just means with attention on your food not on netflix um chewing your food well uh things like that but those in and of themselves are just are just habits right but you can turn them into more of a spiritual practice or more of a ritual and I think that yeah, I, I to, to me another word I like for spiritual practice is devotion. I'm devoting mm-hmm. myself to to this to the process of nourishing or of eating and whatnot. And and there's something beautiful about that. And you know anyone like Eckhart Tolle who will speak at the present moment will say that's all you need. You don't need the Netflix. Like the food is entertaining mm-hmm. enough. But it's that's our resistance, not the resistance of the food. And you know a few hundred years ago, I'm sure people with less distractions. Twenty years ago with less distractions would be able to be more present with the process of eating. Yeah. I, I bet you there's an increase in digestive issues as a result of how much media we're surrounded by now and, and mm. the challenge in being present with the thing that we're doing. One thing I was thinking about recently was, I don't have an aversion to sitting at a table and eating like in a, with the family. I actually like it, but um, we did it all the time growing up. But a lot of times... My dad would pull out like the math problems, like the word problems. And I, math was my worst subject and I scraped uh, by. And so often the plates would be cleared and he'd be like, Leah, get the, get a paper, like get the pencil. We're going to work. And we wouldn't leave the table till this problem was solved. And I just wonder if that had some effect on me or my digestion thinking about it now, like how stressful that must've been for me. Abso- like, absolutely. Yeah. I think, is it, are we going to get on that subject or are we going to talk about something light and easy? Yeah. What do, you, what, what do the Italians do after a nice meal? They go for a stroll. Is it mm. a pa- passeggiano? I forget what it's called. A pisolino? No, I can't remember what it is. It's like a little walk afterwards. I know that yeah. it's a thing. To enjoy the evening air, to enjoy each other's company, not to get something right or to like whatever. And mm-hmm. and, it, and it's interesting because, you know, that's that's a demand, not a request. Oh, hey, Leah, would you like to do a math problem now? You know, it's like, here's mm-hmm. what we're going to do. And you can't get up from the table until you clean <laughs> until you clean your plate. Like, right. of course, of course, of course. And that's really hard. I could see where needing to find autonomy would be so important because mm-hmm. you don't have the autonomy in that way as a child when you're at the table and you can't get yeah. up and leave, you know, and that's. We, that's where the fight or flight or the freeze or the fawn responses come in where we, you know, mm-hmm. I, I'd want to go jump in the ocean too if I was, uh, <laughs> not, saying, not saying that's there, but I, but I get that. It's, it's, when we started talking about bloating, what I saw as a yoga teacher in bloat and as a medical intuitive when I see bloating, the key word to me for bloating, you can substitute it with disbelief. And what do I mean by disbelief? You could say it as belief in something that is not true or that doesn't actually feed or nourish us or not believing that you can possibly be nourished, right? And so, and 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 by disbelief, it can be disbelief in your self-worth, disbelief mm-hmm. that you're wanted in the world, disbelief that the people around you will care about you. Like, mm-hmm. like for me, the, if I was at the table, I would probably join, form a disbelief 
that the people around me are going to really truly care about me you know mm. like which is why I go to that point of autonomy like do you want to do this now right and so when i see someone with a bloat it's a, it's a it's a quality of resignation it's kind of like a oh mm. well and a giving up and and it's it is an investment but it's an investment in a belief that doesn't nourish you there's no room for me i i did it the other night i was uh, I have my favorite taco truck around the corner from me that nourishes me wonderfully. And they're closed on Wednesdays and it was a Wednesday. And, and I, I was like, I don't know what to eat. And I was ready to invest in disbelief. Oh, well, I'm not going to be able to find something that nourishes me. I'll just eat this instead. And I could feel my stomach bloating as I had those mm-hmm. thoughts. And so I was like, wait, stop. My wife was wonderful. She's like, you know, you could do this and we could do that. We have a a, a massive garden full of beautiful food. And I'm thinking, I have to go out and pick it. But I'm, you know, like, oh, well, what's the... And instead, it's like, no, invest in belief. There's food that can nourish me. I'm capable of doing that. All of a sudden, my energy perked up. It was fun to go and make food. And I had a wonderful dinner. So, and and I didn't bloat. I didn't end up with that. And so that resignation bloat and going back to Deanna, if you're still tuned in tonight, that's the part that I see in you is, oh, well, what's the use? Nothing I do will make a difference. It's just the way that it is. And then, oh, and then, and then you sink and you collapse. And, and if you look at that collapse, literally all of your energy is congealing in your stomach. It's like it's it's congesting down into your stomach as opposed to being robust. Digestion is like your belly is, you know, alert. There's no alertness mm-hmm. in disbelief or resignation. And so we lose that quality there, which to me goes to what is the spiritual practice of eating. And, and for me, what makes eating a spiritual practice is when I stop, when I meditate and I go, what would nourish, what I did the other day in the kitchen when mm-hmm. I, I wanted to go for the delicious tacos. I, I stopped and I was like, you know, wait a second, I don't believe I'm capable of discerning what I want. And I don't believe that I'm going to be able to do it. And so, oh, well, I'm just going to eat. No. And and so pause and then get conscious about what I'm investing in. And that's what I do as a medical intuitive. I'm sure you experience that. Like sometimes I'll be like, it feels like you're investing in this. And it's Mm -hmm. like, oh, yeah, no, I totally am. You're right. You know, not saying I'm always right because I'm not. I'm a human, too. But that may be part of what you experienced in that, too. Yeah, for sure. I just wanted to add too when you when you were um, reflecting on like oh what can I do, you reminded me of your own question of like the asking what of me, yeah. <laughs> and uh, you you know took action on that, and then from my perspective too a way that you know sometimes you do have this resistance to like oh, I don't want to go and for you I mean you have the privilege of picking your food which is amazing but you know you don't even want to go into the fridge and chop vegetables and all these all these things but. There are even rituals around that, like putting on your favorite music and mm. getting out your favorite, I don't know, spices and setting the table with your favorite twinkle lights or something, you know, like you can make the energy around food like this happy place to be. And another thing you were saying about bloating, uh, oftentimes with my clients will also, they'll also be working. This is part of the reason why I wanted to collaborate with you is because there's always more going on. Somebody who's looking for nutrition coaching has other things going on in their life, right? Like everybody, but you know, there's sometimes there's anxiety or there's work stress or there's COVID or, you know, yeah. other things. And a lot of the work that we do, especially on, in the first few sessions is like, okay, make like these two nutrition changes. And then there's usually like journaling exercises, like could be self-love reflection, you know, list three things you like about yourself or, um, three things you did well that day. So there's, we're always going into like that deeper layer because mm-hmm. yeah, it's you, like I said, you can check off all those boxes and nutritionally be doing all the right things and you could still see symptoms. Yeah. That's well, th- that's the thing. I could be so strict on my diet when I was gluten intolerant and I go and have a slice of pizza and I'm a, I'm a train wreck the next day. And mm-hmm. that, you know, and then, you know, I, I heal what's going on in myself. I can have a slice of pizza and I'm fine. Like it's, it's, the to me, there it's the two ends of the of the spectrum. It's like if you only change your food, but you don't change the energetics, yeah, you're you become dependent, or you get vigilant or stressed in life, which I could see leading to constipation as well. Or the or, or the opposite end is you give up and you don't care, and yeah. and and then there's no investment in that. And that's to me the bloating is the giving up, don't care part. It's like that. Yeah. Mm. 
you know, as a, go ahead. Oh, I was just gonna say, it's interesting too, that, you know, you could eat a pizza at home with that, like defeated energy of like, I didn't cook for myself. I'm going to order pizza again, like oh, boom me. Or you could go out for pizza with your friends and have this like great experience in community and eat pizza and feel totally nourished and be symptom free. Well, and look at you eating with your family compared to going to the pasta bar at university. <laughs> Yeah. Well, no, that, that I mean, that's I'm sure that's what you're alluding, alluding to when you said that. But mm -hmm. it really is, you know, the, the environment and experience. And so it's interesting when you put on the music and the sparkly lights and uh, and the spices, you're nourishing yourself. You're literally doing things that nourish you. And this is the paradox. I, a good friend, she's a very talented Ayurvedic practitioner and her therapist or Ayurvedic teacher was she couldn't get better. She was sick. And he's like, what do you want? And she said, my mm -hmm. mom's raspberry pie. And he goes, you mm -hmm. need a homemade raspberry pie. Like that's not the typical nutritionist advice, but that is what she went. She needed mother love. And that was the symbol mm -hmm. of it. And that's where it's there. Like, I'm sure if you're anything like my, my wife, pasta is, is, uh, is, is like the comfort food or like there's something in it that really speaks to more than a uh, high carbohydrate content and you know yeah. acidic tomatoes it's not that it's the gathering it's the love that went into it and the care and, mm -hmm. and and the desire to nourish that's the part i love about italians is the desire to nourish right. somebody yeah and you don't grow up with the idea that it's a bad food like labeling like oh this isn't a health it's like you get you get into diet culture and it's like you know, no carbs and no pasta and no white flour. And it's like, what? I grew up eating these foods. Does that mean I'm unhealthy? And you get all, it's confusing. But there's so much confusion around nutrition, right? Well, and this, this gets into the intuitive eating part or the food freedom. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I was thinking about this the other day. How, how did the indigenous populations in Canada know to drink or eat the lichen in the winter when there was no vitamin C that the, all the settler or the colonials mm. that came that got scurvy, they didn't know. Like there wasn't a nutritionist who's like, we've analyzed the content of the lichen and it's got whatever. Like they mm. would have had to been in connection with nature and taste and, and recognize and, and, and have cravings that that would actually nourish them. And I'm sure that all fits mm. into the food freedom part of what it is that you're, you're doing with the people you work with. Yeah, so a lot of it is um, based around removing the guilt from food mm. as well and being able to recognize what it is you're actually craving. And some, so with cravings, sometimes it is a, oftentimes it is a symptom of dysbiosis in your gut, so an imbalanced right. gut. Right. So unhealthy bacteria in your gut are going to crave, you know, sh the sugar, right? Because it feeds them. So it all, that logically makes sense too. Um you, and there you, are other reasons for, for cravings and um, what you said about just that intuitive knowledge. And yeah, we, with that, I feel like it is a really innate knowing of just like knowing yourself and we are given these senses for a reason, right? Like we're drawn to mangoes and sweet foods because they do nourish us. But yeah. when we replace those foods with candy and soda, we, it, it gets confusing because your brain's not, not wired to know the difference. Yeah. 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 It's your body reacts similarly, but it's, you're not necessarily getting the different food. I was, I was caught on a thing. I kept thinking about, about craving, like craving itself to me is not a bad thing, but if mm. you're not, and this is what's so hard about discerning from a medical intuitive perspective, I'm looking at subconscious investments. These are the ones that lie beneath the surface. And what we're trying to do is mm -hmm. make them conscious, which interestingly, the best way to access your super conscious mind, which is the intuitive mind, is to decrease the divide between your conscious and your subconscious mind. The more they're mm -hmm. incongruent, the more your subconscious and your conscious are separate, the more you're going to be disconnected and, and not have access to your intuition. So it's like if you get conscious and cravings, let's take dating. I'm, I don't know what it is. I just like the bad boys or I don't know what it is. I just like unavailable people or I don't know what it is. There's mm. something, it, obviously it's a craving. It's an attraction, but it's not one that nourishes you. Like, yeah, you get an unavailable right. person and yeah. wait a second. This is just poking at that wound that I haven't looked at here. Subconscious investment. 
Ooh, I want to make that conscious. Okay, look, I'm craving sugar. What's going on here? Yeah. Do I really need sugar? No, I don't. What is it? I don't have enough sweetness in my life or whatever that mm-hmm. may be, you know? And so, and, and when you can get in touch with that subconscious investment, you can reclaim the cravings from the superconscious mind, which is the intuitive part, which is, I need a salad, you know, or I need a raspberry pie, you know, whatever it is, it's, you get to reclaim that when you, when you get clear on the subconscious investments. Yeah. I well, I think even being aware of craving some people, you know, you don't necessarily have that awareness. You just think like, Oh, that looks good. Oh, you know, you know, you're not like, you know, I'm really craving raspberry pie. It's like, Oh, I could eat literally anything sweet right now. And you know, my, just, I think even bringing that awareness, like this is my pattern. And from my perspective, I would say, okay, is this your pattern every day at 3 PM? Your blood sugar is probably dipping, like eat a, an apple with peanut butter. And then if you're still craving something sweet, have raspberry pie, or whatever it is. Yeah. 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 Right. Experiment to find out if you really, yeah. Like date someone a little different, you know, find <laughs> like, well, no, I mean, not like, like reprogram your system, expose mm-hmm. yourself to experiences that are unfamiliar because mm-hmm. you're going to take in different nutrient, whether it's nutrient as the quality of presence that the other person's expressing in a relationship context or nutrient in terms of the food and your body will start to readjust. And I, I, I think you talked about this, that sometimes craving is just your system's out of whack. And so it, 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 yeah. Want, it, it's it's asking for the things that don't actually nourish but that it's addicted to or that it's connected mm-hmm. to yeah yeah i mean we're more bacteria than we are human cells so we have to give those guys some attention yeah yeah and it's very interesting well yeah and and and, and honor the intelligence of them they're they're saying they want something and so as mm-hmm. i said cravings inherently aren't wrong they're an indication that something yeah. needs to be fed it's just mm-hmm. what are you feeding you know, are you feeding a disbelief? Or are you feeding a faith? And so going back to that practice of, of spiritual practice of eating or spiritual surrender, what am I really craving? And stop and ask yourself and, and mm-hmm. take the time to, to not just go, oh, well, you know, I, that was me. I was like, oh, fuck it, whatever. I'll just eat, you know. And then, and then I didn't honor that my system has a profound ability to discern. And then the beautiful thing is the more you do that, the easier it gets. You know, the more that you're congruent within yourself, the more being congruent is. I think that that for me, in my intuition program, that's one of my great teachings is the more congruent you are, the more honest, the more clear, the more okay with what's inside of you, the easier it is to get clear on those things because you're not in a war. You're not fighting something. Yeah, yeah it's, it's it's pretty big. Um, sorry, was there... Uh, I don't know if I have any other things that I need to to bring up in here. Do you, do you have other points that you wanted to discuss? Well, I was just going to mention if anybody is live and has questions, they can pop them in at any time. Um, yeah, it looks like we only got a, we still only got a few people online. But if you do have questions, please ask. They they take about thirty seconds to load up for us, so uh, be patient if you put a question in. I ended a live stream once and then got an amazing question when I closed um, it, and I was like, ah, bummer. Um, which which is uh, which is unfortunate, but yeah, it's interesting to me. Spiritual sur- spiritual practice is about opening yourself to something greater than yourself. It's about having faith that things are are not wrong or oh, that's a good question. I'll I'll share it in a second. You know, having having faith that that you can nourish yourself. And then being devoted to the process, you know, like I see the way that you just described your surfing journey as a devotion. Like, as like me, I was completely inflexible when I started yoga. I had, was totally out of balance. I gave hundred percent too much effort with 0% receptivity. And, and, and yet I devoted myself to the practice. And in that devotion, you transform. It's hard to change without devotion. And so taking that journey of, of, of eating as a devotion, I think is really helpful. Okay, so so Shauna's question was, how can I feed the faith? Do you want to give a try at that one? And and then I will. Me first? If you'd like to. I think you should go first. Okay, cool. I just didn't want to presume. How, oh, yeah. How to invest in belief to not collapse or sink. Right. So when you invest in a disbelief, that is a survival mechanism. That's something that I like, that I 
people refer to and I agree with as your adaptive child. It's actually, disbelief is an expression of intelligence. When you're a little kid and you're not going to be seen or you're not going to be valued or you're not going to be noticed, you can fight, you can check out in your brain, or you can say, I don't have the skills, the energy, the fortitude, the, the physicality to advocate for myself. So giving up is actually, I, it, it's an investment. I can invest in giving up and it, it does feed me on some level. So the first part is to honor that the disbelief is a form of intelligence and say thank you to that young part of yourself that chose to go, oh, well, because that was the most reasonable choice you had present with you. And now as an adult, say, what of me? What would nourish me? And notice that fight, you know, Sean asking the question, I can feel you in that fight where the, the need to invest in the disbelief is so great that the ability to invest in the faith is a, is a real challenge to be able to do that. And so it's, it's practice is repeated. Shauna put another one. How can I, uh, she said, how to invest in belief to not collapse in sinks? Yeah, so how do you invest in belief? You start by honoring that little girl that did the best she could to help you survive. And then once she feels seen, respected, you say, I'm there for you. I'm going to advocate for myself. I'm going to draw boundaries. I'm going to speak up. I'm going to take the time to go to the garden and pick the food and make the delicious meal. You have to wash it too. That's the other reason it's hard picking in the garden. <laughs> and my garden's like 200 feet that way. So you got to walk out for a while. Anyhow, um, did you have anything you wanted to add to that or? Um, That's sort of, faith is sort of in my category. So no, no pressure to yeah, do that there, but. No. I was um, just in my mind thinking, like, how does this relate to food and or eating, you know? And I think that part of this and part of why we're here is that eating and food is, you know, activities we do three times a day, maybe more, maybe less. But um, part of what I learned from you actually through other outlets is that what you do on a daily basis can be spiritual and can bring you connection. And you can use everyday things that you do anyway and turn them into spiritual practices or practices of devotion as you um, call them and so just bringing that little added awareness to whatever it is you already do well this is actually one of the first steps i take with my clients is have them do a little bit of a reflection and say like what are the habits i already have what do i do well what do i like and how can i just expand on that and so even taking those things you already do and um, first of all, give yourself gratitude and, and um, acknowledge that you, you know, you're not starting from ground zero, like you, you're starting from somewhere and then you expand from, from where you are and you can, you know, enhance those and make them into even just reframing or like reevaluating what you do, I feel like is a spiritual practice. And that brings more connection. And, and, and you're, you you're bringing energy into the process, the resignation, mm -hmm. oh, whatever, is a disconnect yeah. from, from the intelligence in your system, but also the, the, the fluidity of life or the constant nourishment. For anyone watching this that's a pain in the neck person, you get neck pain. Neck pain from the medical intuitive perspective is not okay with God's plan or not okay with the universe's plan. Or another mm -hmm. way to say that is the thought that this moment is a mistake. Like something went wrong that I don't know how to eat or something went wrong that I don't have energy or something went wrong that, and instead the spiritual aspirant or the spiritual surrendered being or devotional being says, this isn't an accident. What of me? What is this asking of me? What is, and notice as soon as I say what of me, that's the energy of digestion. I feel a robustness in my stomach when I do that because I feel a hunger in that. What of me? The question is, is an expression of a hunger. Mm -hmm. And and when you tune into that and you, and you get to that place, it's not a coincidence where you are. It's not a coincidence that yeah. movement was so hard for me that I had so much pain in my body. It's not a coincidence that surfing was such a challenge for you. And it's not because what Woody Allen said, those who can't teach, it's that it's that this this brought you to your knees to open to something greater than you pr presently were. And that to me is the whole point of spiritual surrender. So, mm. you know, if anything, if you want to get to that place of food freedom, if you're struggling, it's not an accident. It's not a mistake. Yeah. Oh, what a divine creation. What an opportunity for me to address all those places that I don't believe 
that things are gonna work out. I don't believe that I'm worthy of love, care, and attention. I don't believe that I'm worthy of loving and caring for myself or whatever those things are. And those, you know, when you when when mm-hmm. you take that approach in in food consumption, it's 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 so transformative to be able to do that. And I, I love what you said to me one time. <laughs> I, I I had a post I said something like that, and you said, Oh, I'm still working on that every day. And I'm like, but that's why it's a practice. You know, mm-hmm. like that's I work at it every day. I do yoga yeah. every day, not because I've figured it out and I'm good at it, but because yeah. that repetition is part of what gets me deeper and deeper and deeper into mm-hmm. that devotion of life. Yeah. Yeah. So Shauna said, food freedom is what resonates with me. Not mm. sure what that means for me. If you want to elaborate a little bit, but I, Shauna, if you wanted to explain a little bit more on what you mean, but I can elaborate on the concept if that would be helpful. Yeah. Yeah. Do that. Um, that sounds great. Okay. So food freedom is essentially for me, I take it as not labeling foods as good or bad. Rather, there are some foods that are just blatantly and scientifically more nutritious and less nutritious. But it means for me that now this is a little bit like contradicting because I'm, I eat plant-based, but that's from an animal welfare perspective, not from a nutrition perspective to mm-hmm. start with. Um, so for anyone dealing with you know, figuring out what food freedom is, it's not restricting yourself in terms of what you eat, what's good or bad, what's like an, you know, a definite no, or it has to be on the plate every day, right? Like, so you are open to all foods. Um, and, but then, you know, you, you do consider what's going to, nur- what's going to nourish me in this moment. Sometimes what's going to nourish you is a donut. And sometimes it's going to be pasta and sometimes it's going to be salad. And sometimes it's going to be a, a combination um, and food freedom is freedom from guilt from food. So let's mm. say you do indulge, let's say use that, um, in something that you wouldn't normally, you move on the next day. You don't think about it. You don't sit on it. You don't meditate on it. You don't go like, what could I have done better? It's like you're, you can eat unhealthy things and then move on from them. And it's not, it's not going to end you. Um, and it's just, ha- yeah, having that, like, feeling empowered with your food, right? It's, mm. it's um, yeah, just not not restricting yourself because you feel you have to. It's not following someone's meal plan because it has 1,200 calories and it's supposed to get you this result. Food freedom is a lot to do with how does this make me feel. So this is a, a tool I use all the time. Yeah, for me, like, I love chips. And I could easily sit there and eat a whole bag. Me too. And especially if I'm watching TV or something, like that bag is gone. But afterwards, I will get the bloating. And that's just from sodium. Like sometimes there are physical things at play, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, so for me, it's like if I'm at a grocery store and it's like I don't have a craving for chips. I just see them. I just go, how is this going to make me feel? And sometimes I'll still get them and sometimes I won't. But like... If there are things um, at the store that I don't always buy, I usually just go, okay, how's this going to make me feel? And sometimes it's a yes and sometimes it's a no. Um, same thing with like a vegan cheese. You know, if I'm going to make like some vegan pizza and I want some vegan cheese, I'll get it. But it's not an all the time thing. Yeah. And um, so that's one, you know, but I have that that autonomy to be like, yes or no. There's always there's always options, right? I, so, I there's so many things I love in that. Like one of the things I do in the intuition program is intuitive produce shopping where mm. where you go up to the, the 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 thing of mangoes and you say which mango will nourish me the most and you and you just mm. you go to where you're attracted and you yeah. let yourself be drawn to that and then it's interesting the result of that sometimes it's like oh yeah that's a beautiful mango you know you can use your mind oh, it's soft it's firm it smells good it's this color you can also use your intuition i'm drawn to that one Sometimes mm-hmm. I'm drawn to the crappiest looking mango. And and to me, when I do that, I'm like, either mangoes aren't good for me to eat today, or these are all not very good mangoes. Mm-hmm. Like, like the, the best time to do that is when you're buying blueberries, because sometimes <laughs> blueberries, when they're not good, I'm, I'm not so crazy about them. But th- that trust and that intuitive ability yeah. to discern, like that's, I, I when you said it, you, you stop in the aisle and you, and you, uh, and you ask, will these chips nourish me? I, the way I heard that is you kneel at the altar of the of the chip and or of of your your nourishment and you say what I you know will this feed me and if the answer is yes go for it there's no guilt there's no mm-hmm. shame there's no because yeah. the guilt and shame is should 
which gets into tribal programming because you mm. there's there's no such thing as should from an yeah. internal place. Somebody had to role model that for you. And so it's actually a, a self-empowerment. It's a reclamation to do that. Yeah, well, I was going to say with that word should, it's the same thing as like, I should eat that apple. I should eat that salad. It's, you know, there's other ways to eat healthy other than what you've heard on TV or your parents or whatever. And if like, if, if something has an advertisement, you probably shouldn't eat it all the time. I should, I should, I should marry this person. <laughs> I want to marry this person. Mm. Like it's, it's the desire is such a key and desire is a compass for us. I'm like, I notice mm. I didn't say, you know, when you're picking a mango, whichever one you are repulsed by the most, it's the one you're attracted to. It's like letting right. yourself be moved on some level. And so that's, it's connecting to that innate intelligence that we we possess, but so many are disconnected from. And and yeah. I personally, the process of getting more connected to that has been profoundly nourishing because then you make choices, whether someone's like, hey, do you want to come over and watch TV? Nope, I don't. That would not be nourishing. Like you need to be able mm -hmm. to discern that. You're like, oh man, I totally want to come over and watch TV. That'd be awesome. Same act. Mm -hmm. One mm -hmm. fills, one does not. And you've got to discern in yourself which one that mm -hmm. is, and you have the capacity. It's not just that you have to, it's that you have the capacity, mm -hmm. but that takes Definitely. faith, right? Yep, and time. Grocery shopping is going to start taking more time. And my husband, he's always like, I hate shopping with you. Like, you take so <laughs> long. He's like, I'm in and out, but like, I, I literally go through the aisles, I go to the produce, like, you know, yeah. I really do take my time. I, I, I thought of one thing I wanted to say, which is when you said indulge, the mm. uh, the way that my wife indulges is she calls it feasting. I'm going to feast on this. It's like which mm. once again like feasting is a celebration. There's something right. like it's a it's an engagement that feels robust. You know, mm -hmm. like it, it's it's that quality and and you know, I, yeah, I think that's what we're going for. <laughs> I think those are the main things that uh, that I had written out to talk about yeah. tonight. Did you have anything else? I don't think so. I think you covered a lot. Yeah, I agree. It's been really enjoyable to, to talk with you. Reminders again, if you want to connect with Leah, because you do, do you work remotely or is it only in yes. person? Oh, yeah. So no, you work all remote. All remote. Yeah. Although you also do retreats. Yes. Mm. Yes. So there is a retreat coming up in November um, in Lobitos, Peru. So if you'd like to join us for a surf and yoga retreat. That is happening November 20th to 26th. And we have a couple spots left. And um, yeah, and then more more dates to come for 2023, but we don't have those yet. That's awesome. So fun to go mm -hmm. and, and, and connect with you and your spiritual grounds of uh, where yeah. you know the waves and the surf and all that kind of stuff and, mm -hmm. and, and work on that practice. And I'm sure being in community to do that is yeah. so nourishing. I'm, I'm part of a men's group and I'm doing healing I couldn't do without the connection of the other people. So I love that you're actually uh, getting into that. And it, and it, if you want to, so it's leahdonatello.com. And if you want to work yes. with me, uh, you can go to my website. You can you can book a free 15-minute consult with me. I'm happy to connect and see if I'm the right person for you to work with. Or I can work with me through Leah's program uh, if you sign mm -hmm. up for that. Um, and yeah, thank you so much for, for tuning in. And thank you, Leah, yeah, for, thank for, for doing this. And stay on because no, we'll check you. in once we end this here as well. And, sure, uh, sounds good. Thank yeah. you to everyone who joined live. Amen. Amen. Have a, have a great night, everyone, or whenever you're watching this. All right. Bye.